Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for General Chemistry 2. Today I want to finish up our discussion of buffers by looking more deeply at how they work and how we can prepare a buffer that has the exact pH we want. If you ever perform experiments or research in chemistry, cell biology, or medicine, you'll find out that being able to make a buffer is one of the most useful skills you can learn in this course. So let's find out how to do it. To begin, let's think about blood. It turns out that the normal pH of human blood is about 7.40. It can change a little. It usually falls somewhere between 7.35 and 7.45. If your blood pH is outside that range, it can cause serious health problems. For example, having a low blood pH is called acidemia, and it can affect the function of almost all your internal organs. A low blood pH causes everything from headaches, to sleeplessness in early stages, to shock, coma, and even death if it persists for too long. A high blood pH is called alkalemia, and it causes muscle weakness and cramps. Both high and low blood pH are usually indications that there's a greater health issue that's causing it. The most common cause of low blood pH is diabetes. You'll learn lots more about why diabetes causes changes to your blood pH if you take a course in physiology. Low blood pH can also result from poor functioning of the lungs or kidneys, or several other causes, so it's an important symptom your doctor might look for if you become very ill. So, the blood's pH needs to be in a fairly narrow range for the body to function normally. As we learned in the last video, one way to keep the pH of a solution steady is by using a buffer, and that's exactly how it's done in the blood. Remember, a buffer always contains a weak acid or base, and a salt that has an ion in common with the weak acid or base. In blood, the buffer is made of carbonic acid, which is a weak acid, and sodium bicarbonate, which is a salt. Here's the dissociation reaction for carbonic acid. The bicarbonate ion in sodium bicarbonate is part of both the salt and carbonic acid, so that makes this a buffer. As you could probably guess, if we prepare an IV solution that will be injected into someone's bloodstream, it needs to have the same pH as the blood. For that reason, IV solutions contain a buffer. Let's try making such a buffer. Suppose we want to prepare 500 ml of an IV solution. To make the buffer, we'll use 0.100 molar carbonic acid, and we'll dissolve solid sodium bicarbonate in it. What mass of sodium bicarbonate will we need in order to make the buffer with a pH of 7.40? It might not be obvious at first, but you actually already know how to solve a problem like this. All we really need is a rice table. We start by writing the chemical reaction in the first row. We start with 0.100 molar carbonic acid. For the products, we need to think a bit about what the question is telling us. We don't know the initial bicarbonate concentration. In fact, that's what the question is asking us to figure out, so we'll call that x. At the beginning, there are no hydrogen ions, so the H plus concentration is zero. But now what? It seems like we don't have much other information, but we do know that the final pH should be 7.40. We can use that to figure out the final H plus concentration. Remember, the pH is the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. If we plug in 7.40 into that formula, we find that the H plus concentration is 10 to the power of negative 7.40, which is 3.98 times 10 to the minus 8 molar. So, that's the equilibrium concentration of H plus that we put in the rice table. Now that we know that, we can fill in the rest of the table. You can see that the change in H plus concentration is positive 3.98 times 10 to the minus 8. The compounds in this reaction are all in a 1 to 1 ratio, so the bicarbonate also changes by that amount, and the carbonic acid decreases by that amount. And now we can fill in the equilibrium concentrations. The final carbonic acid concentration is 0 0.100 minus 3.98 times 10 to the minus 8. Of course, this is slightly less than 0 0.100 molar, but using three sig figs, it's still just 0 0.100. 
the final bicarbonate concentration is x plus 3.98 times 10 to the minus 8. So now we just need to figure out what x is. As usual, we do this by writing out the equilibrium expression. It's products over reactants, which gives us this. We plug in the equilibrium concentrations, and if we look in Appendix D, we find out that carbonic acid has a Ka of 4.3 times 10 to the minus 7. Now we'll just solve for x. First, we multiply out the terms in the numerator. Next, we get rid of the denominator by multiplying both sides of the equation by 0 0.100. Finally, we solve for x, and we find out that x is equal to 1.08. If you remember, x is the concentration of sodium bicarbonate that we need in the IV solution we're making. So we have 1.08 molar sodium bicarbonate. Now we just need to convert that to the mass. We'll use the definition of molarity to find the moles of sodium bicarbonate. The question tells us we have 500 milliliters of solution, so that's 0 0.500 liters, which means we have 0 0.540 moles of sodium bicarbonate. Finally, we'll use the periodic table to find the mass. It turns out that we need 45.4 grams of sodium bicarbonate. When we dissolve that in the 500 mils of carbonic acid, we should get a buffer with a pH of 7.40, so that would be safe to use in an intravenous solution. So, this is one way of figuring out how to make a buffer. As you can tell, it takes a little time to do this calculation, but it turns out there's a shortcut that we can use. At the beginning of the 20th century, two physiologists, Lawrence Henderson and Carl Hasselbach, were studying how the pH of blood is controlled by the body. It was Henderson who realized that blood contains a buffer, and Hasselbach figured out that the buffer was carbonic acid and sodium bicarbonate. The two of them together developed an equation that gives us a much faster way to determine how to make a buffer with a pH we want. Here's how they figured it out. Think about the dissociation reaction of carbonic acid. We start with the acid, and the products are hydrogen and bicarbonate ions. If you've watched my earlier videos, you might remember that in video 19, we found out that after an acid loses a hydrogen ion, the ion that's left is called a conjugate base. So, in this reaction, the bicarbonate is the conjugate base. Actually, all weak acids have a similar reaction. We have an acid as the reactant, and hydrogen ion and a conjugate base as the products. If we write the equilibrium expression for the reaction, we get this. Now, here's what Henderson and Hasselbach did. First, let's pull the hydrogen ion out of that fraction. Next, let's take the logarithm of both sides of the equation. On the left, we get the logarithm of Ka. On the right, we'll take the logarithm of this combination. Now it's time to use an interesting property of logarithms. It turns out that the logarithm of two things multiplied together is equal to the logarithm of the first one added to the logarithm of the other one. So, for example, the logarithm of 40 times k is equal to the logarithm of 40 plus the logarithm of k. Now let's use that in our equation. We have the logarithm of h plus times the fraction. That's equal to the logarithm of the h ion plus the logarithm of the fraction. Finally, let's move this term to the left side and this term to the right side. It might not seem like it yet, but it turns out that this is a really helpful equation. Here's why. If you look at the left side of the equation, you should recognize it. That's just the pH. And this term, the negative log of Ka, is called the pKa. So we have the pH equals the pKa plus the log of the concentration of the base over the acid. This is called the Henderson-Hasselbach equation, and it's by far the easiest way to figure out the ingredients we need to make a buffer. For example, suppose we wanted to make 250 milliliters of a buffer from 0 0.100 molar hydrofluoric acid and solid potassium fluoride. If we want the pH of the buffer to be 4.00, how much potassium fluoride should we add? 
To find out, we'll use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. If you look at the chemical reaction, you can see that HF is the acid and the fluoride ion is the conjugate base. And that's what we're trying to figure out. So we'll just plug in our data into the equation. The pH is 4.00. To get the pKa, we need to take the negative log of the Ka, which we get from Appendix D. It turns out the Ka is 6.8 times 10 to the minus 4. So that means the pKa is 3.17. The concentration of fluoride is what we're looking for, and the HF concentration is 0 0.100. To solve the equation, we'll subtract 3.17 from both sides, which gives us 0 0.83 on the left. Now we'll get rid of the logarithm by making the left side the exponent on 10. That gives us 6.76 on the left. Now we solve for the fluoride concentration and get 0 0.676 molar. To find the mass of potassium fluoride we need, we'll just use the definition of molarity. We have 250 milliliters of solution, which is 0 0.250 liters. So that means we need 0 0.169 moles of potassium fluoride. The periodic table tells us that potassium fluoride weighs 58.0967 grams per mole. So that means we'll need 9.82 grams to make our buffer. So the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation enables us to fairly quickly find out how much salt we'll need in order to make a buffer with a desired pH. We can also use it with buffers that are made of a weak base instead of a weak acid. For example, suppose we want to make a buffer with a pH of 9.00. We start with 500 milliliters of 0 0.100 molar ammonium hydroxide, and we'll add the salt ammonium chloride to make the buffer. How much ammonium chloride will we need? Once again, we'll use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. If you look at the chemical reaction, you can see that the base is ammonium hydroxide, and the conjugate acid is the ammonium ion. Now we'll plug our data into the equation. We want the pH to be 9.00. Next, we go to Appendix D and look up ammonium hydroxide. When we do, we find out the Kb is 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5. If we take the negative logarithm of that, we get 4.74. But wait, what we want in our equation is the pKa, which is the negative log of Ka. But ammonium hydroxide is a base, not an acid, so the number we got from the appendix is the Kb, not the Ka. That means we have calculated the pKb. How do we get from that to the pKa that we need for our equation? Well, you might remember that the pH and the pOH of a solution always add up to 14. The same is true for the pKa and the pKb. They add up to give 14 too. So, since the pKb we just calculated is 4.74, that means the pKa is 9.26. And we can plug that into the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. That's an important step to remember. If your buffer is made from a weak base, the number you get from Appendix D is Kb, not Ka. So you'll need to be sure that you convert the pKb into the pKa before you plug it into the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. Anyway, now we can finish the problem. The concentration of ammonium hydroxide is 0 0.100, and the concentration of ammonia is what we want to figure out. First, we subtract 9.26 from both sides of the equation, which gives us negative 0.26 on the left. Now we get rid of the logarithm by making the left side 10 to the power of negative 0.26. That gives us 0.550 on the left side. When we solve the equation, we find that the ammonia concentration is 0.182 molar, Finally, we'll convert this to find the mass of ammonium chloride. Using the formula for molarity, we'll plug in 0 0.182 for molarity and 0 0.500 liters for the volume. 
That means we have 0 0.0910 moles of ammonium chloride. The periodic table tells us that ammonium chloride weighs 53.491 grams per mole, and that means we'll need 4.87 grams in order to make our buffer. You'll get plenty of practice using the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation in class and on the homework, and it's definitely something you'll want to understand before we get to the next exam. As I mentioned earlier, knowing how to make a buffer is a skill that you'll use a lot in your chemistry, biology, and biochemistry courses, and also in your research. We've been talking a lot about equilibrium for quite a while now, ever since video 15. The next time we talk, we'll wrap up our discussion of equilibrium with one final topic. And when we do, you'll find out about a big approximation that we've been making all year long that I haven't told you about before. I hope you'll join me for that, and I hope you've learned some useful skills about buffers today. Until next time, have a good week!